Trigger warning, this podcast episode 184 references depression, suicide, addictions, and eating disorders. Some people may find this triggering. If this causes you distress, please seek support and contact Lifeline Australia on 13 11 14 or in a crisis, please contact your nearest hospital or emergency services. Hi everyone, it's Eve Bentley Blowitz from spiritgirl.com and welcome to Feel Good From Within. I'm super excited to be here with you today and with our very special guest, Jay Phantom, who is a entrepreneur, award-winning filmmaker, speaker and writer and author of The Path of an Eagle, How to Overcome and Lead After Being Knocked Down. He's also the host and founder of The Story Box, a top four podcast. And he's been featured in Forbes Magazine, Business Insider, Yahoo, The Morning Show Canada, The Today Show, New York Weekly, The Los Angeles Wire, NBC, Fox, CBS, and Market Watch, among many others. He has also interviewed some of the most high-profile people, world leaders from every field, including Tony Robbins, Mel Robbins, Gabby Bernstein, and the list goes on. Jay, welcome to the podcast show. How are you today? Yvette, it's good to be with you. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. I'm looking forward to speaking with you and sharing my story with your audience. Super grateful we're here with you today and also want to welcome our global audience. I'm super grateful you're here with us today. We're going to learn more about Jay's book and more about his story. So Jay, you're normally interviewing people about their book. So we're going to be turning the tables here. Before we dive into your book, are you happy to tell our audience a little bit about yourself? I sure am. It's sort of very interesting pinch me moment. I've got to try and get my head around the fact that I'm not interviewing you. You're interviewing me. So I've got to try and pace myself as best I can here, you bet. <laughs> a little bit about myself. I get to do an incredible show that I decided to found all the way in November of 2019. So it's been going almost three years now. Can you believe it? And it's just grown enormously. I am a very curious minded individual, I guess you could say. I love asking questions. I love listening to stories and unboxing people's wisdom and advice and getting to learn from them. I love reading books as well. Huge book nerd, if you can tell in the back, this is just one of my bookshelves. I've got another one off to the side here. And I get to connect with people all over the world, from America, from Estonia, even my own country, Australia, all these other great things. I enjoy exercise, enjoy running. I love watching movies. I love hanging out with my friends and family and my dog as well. So that's a little bit about me. And what inspired you to actually write your book, The Path of an Eagle and How to Overcome and Lead After Being Knocked Down? What inspired me to write this book? book. It's actually an interesting story because honestly, I started writing the book almost four years ago now. So it's taken four years in order to get to this point. But back then it was a very different version to what it is now. It was a different title. So I had called it In Failure, You Learn Humility. Not a great title for a book, more like a, a good title for a, like a chapter or something like that. And really what it was back then, it was just me venting and vomiting a lot of the things that I was going through at the time. It was a crazy period of my life. So I thought, you know what? I read books. I got a story that I want to share with people. And I thought naively that if I wrote everything down in a book in sort of like this vomiting story form, then maybe it might become a New York Times bestseller. Very naive of me, I know. But when I finished the first draft, I reread it and I could not believe what I had written. I, I just didn't know what it was. It was just unbelievable. And I sent it to another friend of mine and they couldn't believe what they were reading either because it didn't make any sense at all. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? Never going to become an author. So I decided to shelve it. But there must have been a little part of me that thought, you know what? I may go back to this later on. I just don't know. Lo and behold, I leave it there, a couple of months pass, and I ended up having a conversation with my boss. And he sparked the idea for another book, which is five Ps that I live by every single day of my life. And so I get halfway through that book and I realize, hang on a minute, why am I writing another book when I had this other book that I didn't even finish properly? 
just sitting there. So I made the choice, my grandfather's words of if you start something, finish strong, finish excellently, kept coming back to my mind. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to give up on it. I'm going to go back to it, see what it actually is. And the moment I did that, I deleted everything. I'm like, I'm going to start from scratch. Once again, I removed my own ego and basically prayed a simple prayer and, and was like, God, I need you to give me everything that you want me to say or you would have me to say through my story, whatever it is. And really the path of an eagle comes from my life verse, Isaiah 40 verse 31, which talks about being able to hope in the Lord and he will renew our strength. We'll then be able to soar on the wings like eagles. We'll run and not grow weary and we'll walk and not be faint. And I wanted to encourage people. I wanted to inspire people and share some stories, wisdoms, and insights, not just from my own life, but from people that I've been fortunate enough to actually speak to on my show and share that with young people, with older people, and just say, look, you are your own leader. Here is how you lead your life in the best way possible, out of the darkness and into the light. And so that's why I decided to write it. And it's, I can't believe that it is coming out very, very soon. That's an incredible story. I'm really glad you shared that with us because it just gives us a little insight just how writing a book isn't straightforward for some and it's a journey in itself. And I love the words of wisdom that your grandfather gave you because mm. obviously that really rang true to you and got you back to finish what you first started. And yeah. obviously you love reading books. You're an excellent writer. So there was no problem with you pulling this book off. But even you in that moment had that little voice of, can I really do this? Can I pull yeah. this off? Even though you interview some of the world's best leading authors. So I love how vulnerable you are. In your book, you are very vulnerable when it comes to sharing your own mental health journey, things that have happened to you, things you've learned from that. That takes a lot of courage, especially as a guy too, because as we know, in Australia, men are supposed to be tough. I grew up in an era where men don't cry. Yeah. You don't share your feelings. As we know, when it comes to mental health, we always want to reach out for help. We want to tell people how we're feeling. But yeah. what made you want to share your story in your book? Because you could have easily only shared stories of other people you've interviewed and kept your life on the outside surface, looking like you had everything perfectly in life, like everything went well. You could have had a persona. You could have written a book that didn't go back to the dark side. Why did you decide to open up about your own mental health journey? I believe fundamentally in the power of being vulnerable. And you're right, especially in Australia, there is this negative stigma that men can't cry, men must be tough. But toughness means being able to share your emotions, whether it's to a friend or family member, even what I try and do online, because People relate more and they connect more when you are vulnerable, when you are sharing things that you have been through in your own life. And they say, hey, I'm not alone because guess what? I've been through a similar thing. And if I can share some of my story and, and the things that I have been through in my book and not be afraid of blowback, like who is someone to say to me, why are you sharing this? Like you shouldn't do that. Like, who is someone to say that to me? Honestly, it is more a reflection of what's going on in their own mind, in their own heart. They need to really sit down and for themselves think, well, what's going on in my own heart and my own mind that would make me want to condemn someone else for sharing their own story? Because every story has value to it. And if someone is going through mental health, I don't give people any advice or anything like that. I just share my story. And I say, this is what I went through and this is what has worked for me. If you want to be on the same path as me, find your own path and use these strategies. And by all means, I'm not forcing you. I believe in the power of being able to share and having that courage to step out into the darkness and into some form of light because a lot of people, they suffer in silence and that's not a good thing. 
they bottle things up inside. And that's what I did for a long time. I kept quiet because I believe that my story didn't matter and my experiences didn't matter at all. And that just made me miserable. It made me an, a very angry, a very uncontent and unfulfilled person. I truly believe that we weren't made to be like that at all. We were made to be fulfilled. We we're made with purpose already. We were made with a valuable story. So if I can, at 25 years old, if I can share some of the things that I have been through, some of like depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and even attempting to take my own life, as well as addictions, traumas, all those things, if I can share that, then what's to stop someone else from saying, you know what, because Jay's done it, now I have permission to do the same thing. I can then go and get help because like I say in the book, you have a story. Your story could do so much difference in a good way. You don't know the impact it could have to someone that could be struggling. So if you don't know, that excites me. Once again, why hold back? I know some people might not be ready to share and that is totally fine as well. No one's forcing you to. But please, if you are suffering in silence, don't suffer in silence. We need to make mental health loud not silent. I love that. We need to make mental health loud, not silent. That is such an empowering message. To see you turn your whole life around and then create being a top podcast host, you're now an author, you've been in so many American media outlets. It's so incredible. So for someone who is in the dark right now, maybe they've lost their job, or their partner, or they're facing losing their business or their house. I just see the path of an eagle and your book and story as a reminder of from the dark, there's always light. And it's so interesting, Jay. I was talking to an Aboriginal elder, and one of the key fundamental practices when we go back to ancient rituals is sharing stories. Yeah, the dream time. Yeah. So yeah. exactly. I feel like we're still doing the ancient rituals in modern times where we share stories, we talk about it, and it's just this organic process. But for mm. someone who is going through depression, I mean, you've been there. What were some of the things you found that were of use and of help for your own journey? So a big one for me was actually going and seeking help. And at first I didn't want to, like I balked at that idea of, hey, why in the world would I share some of the things that are going on, my deep, dark secrets with someone? Like, why would I do that? How in the world is she able to help me? And so I sort of made this preconceived judgment already. And I was very angry going in the very first time when I was 14 and led to the age of 15. The first therapist that I saw, she was a beautiful woman. Like she didn't judge me at all. She just asked me the question. So why are you here, Jay? And she let me do most of the talking. But going in before that, I'm like, I don't need to be here. I'm totally fine. There's nothing wrong with me. And so I had that entire attitude towards going in. It was proud and arrogant and egotistical. And I think for a lot of people as well, there's a lot of shame built up too. They don't want to share out of fear of what someone might think of them. So for me, seeing someone and her actually being so nice to me gave me a little bit of permission to actually share. And so what I say is if you have a close friend or a close relative that you trust, and even if you don't, like try and find someone that will listen to you, doesn't say anything back, but listens to you. getting something off your chest for a lot of people does help. It has helped me many, many times. A burden shared is a burden halved. Like we weren't meant to go at this alone. And I think a lot of people are going through their life thinking that they are alone, but they're not alone. And I want to encourage people once again, that one of the foundational aspects to my life that has helped me so much is the ability to share is having that just a little bit of courage. It doesn't take a whole lot. For some people, they may overthink it and think that it takes a lot of courage, but a little bit of courage compounds in a big way later on in your life. So I would say to someone, first and foremost, go and seek the help that you need. 
And then we can work on some other strategies that can help heal that depression, that trauma, because a lot of people have trauma and they don't know they've got trauma, but they know something's going on. So having an explanation can help. I know there's also some useful strategies like body work. There's just so much out there to help you that you don't have to suffer alone or in silence. So please, please don't. And I always say to people, Yvette, that you have a choice. And that choice is you can be a good leader for your own life or you can be a bad leader for your own life too. And I'd much rather be a good leader because I want to lead a life with ultimate joy and purpose and happiness and fulfillment. I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be stuck on the ground. I don't want to go through absolute misery and hell for a long extended period of time. It's not to say that I won't go through it and I have gone through it, but I don't want to stay there. I want to get out. I want to be able to soar in my life. I want to be able to achieve great things. And by me doing that comes from the ability to share openly and honestly and being vulnerable. So hopefully that is a good start. That is a great start. And I just love in your book how vulnerable you are, how you open up. That takes a lot of courage. You are from Australia, but you are breaking the mental health stigma one word at a time, one page at a time with the path of an eagle. Now, Jay, what are some of the things you do when it comes to your own self-care rituals to avoid burnout? Because you have a busy schedule. We just spoke before we hit the record button. You're going to be interviewing another incredible author tomorrow morning at 2.30 a.m. That's early. How do you look after yourself so you don't burn out? Well, this is a good one because sometimes I get a little bit deflated. There's so much going on, lots of work. Running a podcast is no easy thing to do. I mean, you would know that, Yvette. I mean, there's a lot of things happening, especially trying to launch your own book. So for me, I have a philosophy in my life, and that is, If I can beat the sun, then no matter what comes my way during the day, I can beat that too. And really where that comes from is time in my life where I just, I needed that reassurance. I needed that philosophy enormously. I needed to change my life. I needed to change a lot of things because I was burnt out. I was in hospital when I came up with this philosophy. If I can beat something that is constant, that happens every single day without fail, then what's to stop me from putting things in place that are going to contribute to my overall well-being, a healthy version of myself, like getting up at 4 a.m. in the morning. I know that is sounds crazy to a lot of people, but once again, it's that beating the sun, get it done. I read my Bible, I spend time with God, and then I pray, I meditate on those words, and then I get out in nature, I pound the pavement, I exercise, and I run for a period of time. And that is releasing all these endorphins and adrenaline and dopamine and all these chemicals that we need as well, in moderation, obviously. And then also, after I've done my workout, I get back home, I take the things I need to take, and I prepare for my day. These days, I try my best not to overextend. So if I have something to do that is priority for today, I'll get it done. But if I can't get it done today, then I'll leave it for tomorrow. And that's totally fine. I don't feel guilty about that. I'm not great at procrastination. So more than likely, I'll get it done today. But I don't want to stress myself out too much because it's not good. I'm in a relationship at the moment as well. I'm trying to sort of prioritize certain aspects of my life and my time. It's the highest priority of all and things that go in there, it contributes to my overall health. But the morning especially is my time. Nighttime, not for me. (laughs) I'm in bed very, very early. So I try and prioritize getting a good night's sleep, but then also getting a lot done very early in the morning. So that helps me feel great and perform at optimal levels and avoid burnout. That is incredible. And have you always been the 4am type or has this come through reading all of these books that you do for the Storybox podcast and learning from other entrepreneurs, how they prevent burnout? I haven't actually always been like this. Uh, It only came from I think it was around 2016, 2017, 
was sort of like the time that I started getting up really, really early. Because as a teenager, I got up at a later time. I've been a relatively early riser, like 6 a.m. wake up call. And I know that Robin Sharma has a book, The 5 a.m. Club, and he talks about all the scientific reasons and the philosophical reasons of why people do get up before the sun has even risen. But you just feel so much better about life. And I say as well, I much prefer to wake up early than go to bed late because I get more done early in the morning. And if you think about it as well, you can get more done early in the morning than you can late at night when you're tired and you're fatigued. So I wake up and I'm a bundle of energy. I've got to release some of that nerves and stress and it works for me. It might not work for somebody else, but all the people that I've spoken to and they've watched me and they've I guess, being inspired by some of the things that I do in that respect, they've all come back to me and said, Jay, even though it's hard and it's tough, I can see the difference. I can see the change now. And I'm really starting to enjoy getting up before the sun has even risen because you never regret doing a workout. You never regret getting up at that particular time in my experience. And a lot of my friends have said the same thing to me. So whether or not it is a business person doing business early in the morning or working on things for their mental health. I personally just prefer it to wake up at 4 a.m. But no, I was not always like this, but it is possible at any stage of your life. I really believe that if you make that choice. I was up actually really early and sometimes I do get up at four o'clock. I think I heard Joe Dispenza does that. I think he gets up at 3 a.m. So many people I interview also uh, early rises, but I did discover from a guru once that if you bow to the sunrise and pay gratitude, that it's a really good thing and to wait mm. with the natural environment. So I also am pretty strict. I do the meditation, journaling, gratitude, exercise, whether it's outdoors or yoga. And it just happens. I look forward to it now. It was hard originally to set the alarm, get up and do it. But now I'm in such a habit that I look forward to it. And I always feel good. And I'm like you, Jay. I've got to do stuff in the morning. I'm not much of a nighttime person. I'm just like out for the count. Your book, you also open up about addiction. That's a pretty hard thing to overcome. Yeah. And a lot of people don't like to talk about it. That was one of the hardest chapters I've ever had to write, but I think it's one of the most important chapters of the book as well. And it's one of the most important things that I can share with people because it started when I was 12 years old. I was addicted to pornography and that was like literally one of the worst addictions I've ever had in my entire life because it controlled everything that I thought, did, how I acted in the world and having that sort of level of control by something that was quite quiet in my life, like nobody knew that I was addicted to it. It was like my shameful best friend. And I didn't want to reveal that best friend to anybody. And I struggled with it for such a long time. And I even tried it at different points in my life to stop watching, but I couldn't. And I didn't know why or, or how to actually overcome this until much later on in my life. So I started exercising. I joined a CrossFit gym. And what was happening, I started losing weight. And I didn't notice that one addiction was sort of fading away. And that was the porn addiction because my hormones were changing. I didn't have the same urge or the same desire to want to watch porn anymore. It was mainly towards exercise, though. And I didn't notice that exercise can be in fact an addiction and that addiction was taking over this other addiction which then led into eating disorders and anorexia and bulimia later on and i didn't notice any of that was going on i chose to ignore people that love me and concerned for me but all i was concerned about was i'm no longer watching porn in this instance this is working so i've got to continue to do it and i think for most of my life it's either all in or nothing <laughs> there's no balance for me or there wasn't any balance for me and I'm learning how to be more balanced today but it all came to a crashing halt when I ended up in hospital with a blocked bowel I was in hospital for nine days and that was sort of like this reveal I lost all my dignity I had to confront a lot of things about myself that I didn't want to confront it was painful it hurt like hell but it was the best thing for me 
it was the best thing for my growth. And I learned that even though I'm an addict in recovery, like I've got an addictive personality now and I've got to be mindful of that. So it's very easy for me to just become addicted to all kinds of things, substances. I avoid smoking and drinking. I've never drunk a drop of alcohol in my life and never smoked a cigarette, but it's been more like these behavioral things that affect the chemical aspect to your body. So what I've learned these days is all my practices in the morning of getting up, of prayer and meditation. And then it's just also being more mindful of areas of my life. I decided to stop watching porn altogether. I was building a habit of not going back to it. So all those habits that I had created and built up because of the addiction, I needed to break them and create new healthier habits in their place, which took quite a bit of time. I'm not going to lie. And it was extremely painful, but I did it. And I'm thankful that I did do it because I'm in a much better place now. I'm no longer addicted to pornography. I haven't watched it since I first quit, which is a while ago now. And these eating disorders, I'm in a much better, much healthier place in my life. There's a lot of damage that's been done like IBS and my bowel is no longer the same because I made that choice and I didn't listen to people. And that is the result. That is the consequence to my addictions. And I have to live with that for the rest of my life. So for those people that are in a a place of any addiction, whatever it is, there are always going to be consequences to that addiction and they're not going to be good. It may feel good in the moment, but in reality, in hindsight, looking back, it's not good at all. Like it just puts you on a very dangerous path of self-destruction. And a lot of people that are addicted, they end up destroying their life, sadly, because they choose not to get help because the addiction is so strong. And I think as well for those people that are suffering with substance abuse or whatever it is, you've got to go and seek help. That is the fundamental aspect to addiction. And obviously I haven't dealt with substance abuse and all that sort of stuff in my life, but I have dealt with addiction and it's a similar kind of principle. Addiction is addiction. There's levels of it, but it still pretty much affects people in a relatively. It's wonderful you shared that because you clearly have identified that you have addictive nature. I also have the same. I started eating chocolate, Cadbury, (laughs) and then I started eating one full family chocolate bar per night. It was an addiction, right? And anything, whether it was alcohol, it gets in your system and then you crave more, more, more. And if you can't live without it, you can't stop thinking about it, you're pretty much addicted. So I have to be really careful also with social media because that can become addictive. And I've been down that path and that's not a good path either. So it can happen to any one of us. And I'm sure all of our listeners going, yeah, I'm addicted to this or that, or we all have our tendencies. And it's interesting, Jay, because I interviewed Jo Lamble. She's a child psychologist and she's written The New Teenage and the minimum age for pornography in Australia is the age of 12 with every child now being told they need an iPhone or having a tablet for school, they've all got access to the World Wide Web. Mm. You turn to God. Some people might be listening in and have their own God or their own religion or they might talk to the universe or whatever it might be, like everyone's got their own thing. But have you found that to be a very powerful anchor? Absolutely. Before I touch on my faith and its importance. I did want to mention another reason why I wrote this book was when I was 12 years old, when I was a young person, I wish I had something like this available to me because then it would have made me feel like I wasn't more alone because I I felt very alone. I felt very ashamed. So if you are a young person listening to this, doesn't matter what stage of life you're at, there is a way out. There is a path forward. And you know, I just hope that This book is going to encourage people in a good way. My faith is my guiding light, is my navigational compass. Without it, I don't think I would be here today. And I say in my book, ultimately, that I owe God everything and he owes me nothing and he still continues to give. He has put me on the path of an eagle. And even though I have said that it is called the path of an eagle, it was God's path to begin with. He has given me one of the best stories ever, and I am so grateful for that. And 
I just want to continue to live my life and bring glory to his name as best I possibly can. Because who am I? I'm an average everyday Australian. Sure, I've been able to do these things that people think are quite amazing. But for me, it was God that made a way for all of that. And I'm just the vessel. And God is the master. And I am in service to him. And I love that. It is just so amazing because when I die and go to heaven, I want God to say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. I entrusted you with much and you showed up and you did the very best you possibly can. And that's enough. That is really enough for me. That is the importance of my faith. And I know people may not believe in that and that is totally fine. I'm not trying to force any of this down anyone's throat. It's just how I live my life. And if my life is an example of bringing any kind of glory to God, then I hope people see that. I can clearly see that. And I know everyone who grabs a copy of The Path of an Eagle will clearly see that. And obviously, the story box was born from your dark times to the light. And then you had this passion and desire to share what are the world's best class leaders doing and how can we learn from others so it's incredible though you give credit to god the creator because that's a very beautiful thing you could have just taken all the credit which many people do it's all me it's all me because we do live in a me me world yeah where people are applauded for being about themselves, but you're very much about helping other people and connecting other people and sharing stories. When your book launches, it's coming out now in September on the 27th. I mean, how are you feeling, Jay? You read a lot of books. I could see all your books in the background. I know how many authors you've interviewed. How does it feel? Pretty surreal, to be honest with you. That's sort of like a lot of nerves, excitement, all kinds of emotions, honestly. But I think one of the main ones is something that I've written is now going to be available for the world. They can access that, the story that God has given me and all these aspects to it. I'm just like, wow. It's unbelievable that a 25-year-old is sharing his story like this in that kind of way. I think it's truly remarkable how it even got to this point. Even though the story of getting it published, Yvette, is just absolutely incredible. And there were so many like God moments along the way, right? I'm excited to see what God does with it. I'm nervous for myself. <laughs> oh, don't be. Um, and I just hope that it, it helps people. Honestly, I just hope that it helps as many people as humanly possible realize they can be an overcomer. They can be a great leader if they choose to be. I love that. Well, I've read your book, which I think is incredible for helping to break down the mental health stigmas. We need these stories. I think to empower people that their story matters, mm. that they have a story within them. The most incredible people in the world have gone through a dark period in their life, have gone oh, yeah. through something so tragic, traumatic, horrible, but then use that for good like what you're doing jay and it's just incredible to see yeah i was reading all of the reviews already mal robbins says jay's stories will grip you move you and inspire you the path of an eagle is one for story lovers and those searching for wisdom truth and real connection in their lives i mean that's from Mel Robbins, New York Times bestselling author of The High Five Habit and The Five Second Rule, world-renowned motivational speaker. Now, Jay, if this doesn't become a New York Times bestselling <laughs> book, I don't know what will. I know it doesn't matter if it doesn't become a New York Times bestselling book, but I'm pretty confident it's going to be. After reading all your reviews, <laughs> I'll just add my review there and that'll really take it over the line, guys. You're amazing, Yvette. Honestly, I would love for this book to get out into the world to as many people as humanly possible. And if it does become a bestseller, then even better because it's going to reach more and more people. I think originally the naivety of me intentionally writing this book, thinking that it would one day become a New York Times bestseller and then actually getting it to where it is today in its actual form. Hey, it's a book. 
it's an actual book. <laughs> like, that for me is like, wow, it's incredible. And if it does, who knows? I'd be over the moon. I'd probably cry and who knows what else. <laughs> but it, would, it would just be just incredible, honestly. But I'm not, not going to like hold my breath or have any kind of expectation about it. I know God's already gone before me. And he's going to do some incredible things with it. And all I've got to just do is be faithful and yeah. and see where he takes it. You've written it for the people. The intent is to help people. And whatever comes your way will be a surprise. And I remember speaking to this old guy once and he said, with a book, it's like you fly a flag and you put it out there and you just see which way the flag goes. <laughs> and I was like, okay, right. And he goes, and I'll give you another tip. Just don't quit your day job. <laughs> and I go, hey, <laughs> great. Now, Jay, I could talk to you forever about your book, They're Conscious of Time. What is your hope for your newfound book readers? I hope that this book is a guiding light, that it helps people that are in darkness, that are suffering in silence, that it shows them exactly what it takes to overcome and lead their own life in the best way possible towards fulfillment, towards growth, towards learning. It's so much better to actually face up to the pain and to go through the pain and to keep running from it. You're going to end up doing so much more damage to yourself and you're never going to be out of pain if you stay stuck. And so I want to encourage people that do end up picking up this book that there is hope, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. If you decide and make the choice, just go through some pain. And you're going to reach the other side because you weren't made to be stuck on the ground. You were made for the skies, my friend, to soar higher than you ever have before. I love that. To soar higher than you ever have before. You weren't made to be stuck on the ground. That's such a beautiful ending to the podcast show, Jay. So congratulations again on your book. Can't wait for it to come out. Can't wait for everyone to grab a copy of The Path of an Eagle by Jay Phantom. We've got an Australian author. Thank you so much again for sharing your book, story, words, wisdom, tips, and how you avoid burnout, which is so important. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful we got to have this opportunity. And thank you for sharing your story with our audience. I'm so grateful. You're amazing, Yvette. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share my story and to openly be vulnerable with you and your audience. I hope that it has helped in some way, shape or form. Thank you again, Jay. It's been awesome. Thank you so much, Yvette. You're amazing. See you later. Thanks for listening into this Spirit Girl podcast episode. I hope you found this conversation of interest and benefit to you. In support, I would love for you to subscribe to Feel Good From Within with Yvette Lee Blowett's Spirit Girl podcast, to leave a five-star rating and a review of what you think too, to share this show with your family, friends, and community. Be sure to subscribe to my mailing list at spiritgirl.com and yvetteleblowitz.com and to follow Spirit Girl and Yvette Lee Blowitz on any social media app. And together, let's feel good from within.